Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Well, ready? My name is Brian Brown. I'm the curator of entomology here at the Natural History Museum. Hands up if you know what entomology is. Wow, someone yell it out for me. Bugs, that's right. So my title is probably much more impressive to your kids than to you. But I'm more uh, relative to what we're doing today. I'm also the co-director of the Urban Nature Research Center here. And tonight, we're, or today, we're really excited to have a panel discussion about something that we're all interested in, and that is the LA River. We're doing this panel, uh, hosting the panel in partnership with the UCLA La Crete Center for California Conservation Science. Boy, that's a long title, I gotta get that right. <laughs> UCLA La Crete Center for California Conservation Science. And we and the La Crete Center share a lot of common interests. We're interested in the study of insects. Did I say insects? I meant wildlife <laughs> here in the Los Angeles area. All kinds of nature that is here and how it's affected by the city. Of course, the LA River, maybe it's not the first place you think of when you think of LA nature. How many people here have actually gone to the LA River with the intention of seeing nature? Well, that's more than I would have thought. We've uh, done studies here at the museum associated with the LA River for many years, including just a couple of years ago, we did some survey work there. And personally, I was astounded at the amount of wildlife that was there. I mean, insects, yeah. So, a lot of them were in the trees that were growing in the center of the channel or on the, in the pocket parks beside there. And I met a lot of local people who use the LA River as a natural area for their day-to-day -day activities. So that was surprising to me. So the La Crete Center and us had teamed up to study Los Angeles nature on a number of occasions. Uh, in the past, we've done uh, studies on, or programs about biodiversity in LA's backyards, about feline conservation, big cats, as well as domestic cats and their effects on wildlife. So we're doing similar things to try and bring you closer to our nature. And of course, LA's nature is gonna change with the imminent revitalization of the LA River, and we're both going to be a part of it. So to find out something about these changes, today we have a discussion that's going to be moderated by Pat Morrison. I want to welcome you, the panel, and turn it over to Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. What I really thought we should have called this was the Los Angeles River, who's laughing now? <laughs> <laughs> but this is our last frontier ecosystem here in Los Angeles, and what we do with it is going to determine really how healthy the environment of the entire city is going to be for at least a century to come. Now, for hundreds of years, it was a native place for fish, plants, animals, birds, but in the course of 150 years, we turned it into a garbage chute. It's where we dumped our industrial waste. The Los Angeles City testing facility for low flush toilets was on the banks of the LA River because, hey, why not? Everybody else did. <laughs> now, we have lost 99% of our coastal wetlands. We're building subdivisions up into the mountains and we have paved so much of Southern California that when it rains, it doesn't do what it used to. It doesn't soak into the ground and get purified as groundwater. It washes away into the storm drains, into the flood channels, into the Los Angeles River. And then we have to turn around and buy somebody else's water because we're flushing away our own. So here is our chance to make something natural of the river again. And that is why we are having this discussion today. What can it be from what it was? And if we start with the goal we're discussing today, making it a natural place, exactly what does that mean? Does it mean only native species? Because I would wager that most of us here in this room are not native to LA and the river is kind of like us. What does it mean to turn it back into something else? And what is open space? I mean, a golf course is open space, but it's not habitat. So 
The river represents some of the worst of what we've done to the environment, and it may also hold the possibilities for making it the best that we can do with a template. And so that's why we're here with the people who are going to be speaking today. We're going to be talking up here, and then we're going to be taking your questions a little later in the program. Brad Schaefer is a professor in two departments at UCLA. Some of them kind of have things to do with bugs, but he's more into <laughs> reptiles and amphibians. True. Ecology and environmental biology and the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. He's founding director of the UCLA Lacrette Center for California Conservation Science and is especially interested in the ecological recovery of Southern California. Brad, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Christine Pewich is founding principal of the LA River High School. It's got a curriculum that's based around urban agriculture, water conservation, and the LA River is right there as their, back, uh, their backyard laboratory. And she has, this is kind of like a state of the union, two special guests we're going to be hearing from a little later. Thank you. And Mike Affeld is the interim director of Mayor Garcetti's LA River Works team. He's got the money to spend, he's got to get the money to spend, and then we all have to figure out how to spend it. So thank you for being here. <laughs> So I, I want to start with Brad because the idea, we're starting with, with kind of a, a nirvana, kind of a fantasy idea that we will have a natural river habitat, even a native river, ha river habitat. So talk about what that would look like and then give us the odds. <laughs> Man, uh, what would that look like? So I think what a natural river habitat would look like is a river that is a whole lot more native and more natural than it is right now. That's a pretty low bar if, if for any of you who've been out on the river. Um, it would be a river where we at least incrementally got rid of non-native species and brought in native species. And that's easy to do with certain things. You know, birds are pretty easy. Insects that Brian likes are, you know, maybe somewhat easy. Um, it's really hard with fishes. There's not a single native fish that lives in the LA River and, right now and uh, in the lower what? parts. What? Goldfish don't count? <laughs> they don't. Sorry, Pat. Oh my God, all those parents <laughs> who lied to your kids. Oh boy. So I think for certain groups of animals, for birds, uh, for plants, it's relatively easy to have a river that looks and feels and acts natural and native. Um, I think for fishes, for my beloved amphibians and reptiles, getting native frogs back in the river, I think that's gonna be really hard. What are the odds of it being a perfectly native river? Zero. What are the odds of it getting better? I think 100%. Uh, and Christine Pewich, when we talk about the river, we think of it as 52 miles, but of course the watershed is the size of the island of Maui, so every storm drain is part of the river. You know, every flood control channel, every little rivulet down, down, that goes down a canyon is in a sense part of the LA River. So when you talk to kids, when kids at your school think of it, how do you connect the larger environment to what it is that they're doing? So I think um, one of the ways that we try to do that is we embed uh, conversations about the environment and the LA River and Los Angeles in our science classes. So because of our close proximity to the river, our students get to go down and actually do water testing and learn about where the runoff comes from. Um, we've been able to be involved in a lot of local community uh, projects where um, the students get to study and understand the impacts of having this waterway in this local community, how it impacts the quality of water, how it might impact the wildlife. Um, we've done river cleanups on a regular basis, and it's amazing what you know students find. <laughs> Obviously, they have lots of gloves on, and it's all very safe. Um, but I think that they have a real clear sense of how the river um, impacts their community and how the, their community impacts the health of the river as well. And so do they come to an understanding that just because it's green doesn't necessarily mean it's healthy for the habitat and the environment? Absolutely. I mean, one of the, one of the science teachers really focuses a lot on what are native plants. And when they go down and have that experience of being in the river and working with the ecology that's there, it becomes clear that this is not exactly um, how things were originally. And, and Mike, um, you, you're trying to please all the people all the time over there in the mayor's <laughs> office. And if Abe Lincoln couldn't do it, I'm sorry, I don't think uh, Eric could, but you know, thinking highly of him nonetheless. But, but what is the kind of pushback when we talk about making it 
um, if not purely native, then um, a real habitat again, because they're conflicting interests. When they were doing the cornfields, it was, well, do you want flooding? Do you want seasonal flooding, which is good for the environment, or do you want soccer fields and playing fields? So what are some of the considerations going on in the mayor's office right now about making these choices? Well, obviously, the, the river corridor is many things to many people. Um, we can talk about it being a transportation corridor, we can talk about it being a recreational resource, and we can talk about it like we are today as being a place where ecosystem and habitat can come back to, to Los Angeles. Um, it's true that the, the odds are very low that we'll you know, be able to fully restore because we are dealing with a very highly altered river, uh, a very engineered system and that starts at the river channel which is you know uh, mostly concrete and it goes out into the watershed and our storm drains are all are also concrete as well and so that's the primary constraint against a you know a full vision um, uh, as you might imagine if we could do anything we wish to of a restored river and floodplain is that we have an engineered system that is put there for flood risk reduction and that's and we need to respect that even as we find the opportunities where we can make interventions that will make sense within that context. And Eric Garcetti's been very committed to the idea of river restoration as long as I have known him. What, what is his vision? If you had to do a pie chart about where the, the money and the interests and you know, the priorities would go when it comes to the river, what would it look like? And what flavor would it be? Right. Well, you're absolutely right that uh, Mayor Garcetti has a long history of river advocacy. He was one of the founding members of the ad hoc committee, the council committee on the Ellie River back in uh, the early 2000s, which, and that committee is uh, what championed development of our LA River Revitalization Master Plan, which is the city's guiding vision. It was published in 2007. So that master plan really, that's, that's on the record, that's what the city's um, intent is, and the mayor's intent uh, is very, for the river is very much in line with that. And it starts with um, public access and awareness and appreciation of the river. And I think this, uh, this talk today and actually this turnout here is emblematic of some of the success that we and the larger river community has had in raising awareness. And public access, I think, is a, the next really primary part of the mission. Getting people to the river uh, to enjoy it, to enjoy the bikeways, the trail system, the parks that are sprouting up. We have a lot of success in that front. We have, there are many uh, projects that are already open, but we have key gaps in the system, uh, especially the bikeway system, which of course relies on connectivity to really be used most effectively. So in terms of investment and priorities of investment, Right now, the city, in partnership with the county, is heavily investing in design of the bike path up in the valley. Metro is investing in the design of the bike, uh, in the uh, studying the bike path in the downtown to create connected system. So public access is huge, and of course, the other big piece, I'd say, there are, there are other pieces as well, but the two primary thrusts are this public access and, of course, the ecosystem restoration. So we're the local sponsor. Um, in partnership with the federal government, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, on a study on an 11-mile uh, portion of the river for ecosystem restoration, which is largely what we're talking about today. Um, so those are the two main thrusts. And, and as far as um, uh, that, that pie chart, I mean, are, are you assigning at this point any percentages at all? Because there, there are going to be some conflicts. If you look at ideal species, ideal habitat places, you look at a place like Camp Pendleton, where no civilians are allowed to go. It, you know, marine and military bases have become a haven for endangered species because people aren't allowed to go there. That's not going to happen with the LA River. So how do you strike a balance that's affordable, politically acceptable, and environmental? Right, we have to have these uses coexist. Um, the river, in some ways, tells us what is appropriate to do where. So in, let's say, the San, the San Fernando Valley, where much of it, is a uh, very tightly constrained um, vertical wall box channel, the river, um, where more people are built directly up, you know, right to the edges. Um, we definitely are focusing on trails and parks and public access. Um, and of course, there's the existing Sepulveda Basin recreation area also, which is up in the San, in the San Fernando Valley, which has natural ecosystem as well. And the portion of the river that does not have concrete in its bed, which is called the Glendale Narrows, that's the focus of the ecosystem restoration area. It already has this vital habitat. It is uh, ripe for improvement in that, uh, in that sense. 
Um, so the river is telling us where we should focus. But the, you know, a recre recreation or transportation will have to come through that area, so we have to make sure that it's compatible. Um, you mentioned the example of we have to be careful of interaction, right? We don't want to restore a lot of valuable habitat and then have people necessarily coming through it sort of uh, in a way that could be damaging after the restoration exists. Uh, so the study we did with the Army Corps and the, the plan that came out of that um, has, uh, you know, diagrammed out the ways that compatible recreation, more passive uses like trails, wildlife viewing, uh, could exist alongside that. And, and Brad, part of the problem with, with habitat in Los Angeles is that it's cut up into little, species, into, into little pieces. Yep. And 80 years ago, the Olmstead Plan had this idea to connect it all into this emerald necklace from the LA mm -hmm. River across out to the beaches and the mountains. How dependent is the LA River going to be on making itself connected to others to be actually viable and not essentially a zoo? Well, again, it depends. I, th it, I mean, you really have to look at the particular animals. I'm a zoologist, not a botanist, so I think more about animals. Um, connectivity when you're thinking about birds is very, very different than connectivity when you're thinking about a lizard. Birds can fly. They can fly over patches that are not good habitat for them. Um, and so even right now, go down to the LA River and walk along it, and you'll see a lot of native birds and a lot of, of birds that are very, very clever at making use of what's there. And the connectivity is much more there for them than it is for other species. Um, I mean, in general, connectivity is an issue not just in the LA River, it's, a, it's, it's an issue in you know, the Rim of the Valley project that the National Park Service is involved with, it's an issue across the state of California. and. I think one of the things, and I think this is consistent with some of the ideas Mark, Mike is uh, saying, is that you, know, you have to put connectivity into the context of where we are and who we are and, and what is reasonable. We're not going to have, I don't believe, full connectivity of aquatic ecosystems all across LA. That's just not going to happen, nor is it going to happen across the state of California. However, you can do assisted migration. That's a, that's a big buzzword right now. Like in, tunnels? In the ecological world. Well, no, it means, it means in its sort of simplest form, it means that we move the animals if they can't move. If they used to move between point A and B and they can't anymore because there's a freeway in between, well, we move them. And we do that in a way that mimics what they used to do in the past. And we can use a lot of fancy tools a lot of genetics and genomics work that I'm very involved in to figure out the, the extent uh, to which they used to move between habitats, and then we can sort of mimic that for them. And that's a very effective way to create connectivity where you need it. There, there's one other thing about connectivity uh, that to me is very important, is that when you think about fully connecting pieces of habitat, you have to remember that if you're trying to keep non-native pest species out. Well, when you connect things up, you're connecting them for them too. And so that's something you really have to kind of keep in mind is that sometimes you can use connectivity as a tool to keep out the species you'd prefer not to have there, as well as a tool to try and, and bring in the species you do want to have there. That requires a lot of basic knowledge of the biology of those animals and plants um, and, and some very careful planning. And that, Christine, maybe is something your kids are learning to figure out too, what's native, what's not native, what should be there, what shouldn't be there. So I, I think the river has become sort of a larger metaphor for uh, teaching our students about the importance of maintaining the environment. That's the bigger educational goal. And so one of the things that we've developed at our school over the last two and a half years is we have an actual working organic farm. Um, and, and the students are responsible for everything that, that goes into that farm and everything that comes out of that farm. And that includes them learning about how to run water systems, how to conserve water, um, how to grow and plant you know, what's native. Um, in addition to teaching them to care for animals, we actually have uh, birds and chickens and pigs and the whole thing. Um, so, the, so the larger goal, obviously, is to help uh, students understand that if you take care of the environment, you understand where your food comes from, um, you conserve, that 
ultimately, hopefully, we won't end up in a situation two, three generations from now where we're battling some of the impacts of, of what's happened to the LA River. And I think that very hands-on approach um, has really impacted our student body. You see kids leaving school at the end of the day with their eggs and their cartons and garlic thrown in their backpacks and going home and, and making good use of this. So we're really trying to sort of, in our small way, um, do the educational piece with our students and then eventually spread that out into the local community um, in that larger educational focus. You know, water can't flow uphill, but, but information can. And yes. so you, the kids will take this home and even one household at a time, they may say, don't dump the oil down the street or no, that goes in the recycling bin, not the trash bin. Are you, are you seeing that kind of Absolutely. I mean, I think, and I think that's the beauty of this generation is that, you know, they're very tuned in to recycling, to, to you know, just to, um, to waste and to, to throwing things out that they haven't used. When students actually learn how to grow things, they understand how much it takes to do that. And so they're less likely to throw away something they haven't eaten or to, you know, kind of, uh, in, I think the habits that some of us who are a little bit older have sort of gotten used to, you know, they're much more tuned in to trying to, to um, to not let that happen. Another quick example is that in LAUSD we have what's called a breakfast in the classroom program where all students eat breakfast together first 15 minutes of the day. And there's always a lot of excess waste. Mm -hmm. Teenagers don't drink milk, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> we still have milk every single day um, delivered to the classrooms. So we're making use of that in terms of taking all of that waste and we feed the animals. We're sort of Again, trying to create that cycle so that we're not wasting all of this extra food that the students aren't eating and, and teaching them, again, how can you reuse that and, uh, again, create an environment where there's less trash and waste. And Mike, how is the mayor's office working to integrate that? Because we'll get all get flyers from City Hall saying, don't do this, do do that. But this, is, seems, to, this seems to be where it really engages. When your kid comes home and says, uh-uh-uh, we, uh, we love to participate in educational programs, outreach, uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, we obviously, our, our first job, first and foremost, is try to make the, make the vision happen along the river and build the projects that we you know, have, have promised, um, and then identify the plans and the funding for future projects. Um, but we, you know, we have participated in, in programs with, um, with uh, the Ellie River High School, in the past, and it's been very fruitful. Uh, in a lot of ways, we rely in the river community um, on established partners who do a fantastic job with outreach. And um, I don't mean to call you out, Stephen. Stephen Mejia is here from Friends of the Los Angeles River, and is um, a, a, you know their organization and, and the work that Stephen does with the LA River Rover and other uh, programs is a crucial way to uh, to spread the, the message and educate about programs they're doing, wildlife in the river, and programs the city and other agencies are, are pursuing. Um, Brad, with climate change, that's something that's of concern for biologists, it's of concern True. for people in the mayor's office who know that this is going to be expensive. How is that calculated into visions for the LA River as a natural place? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think that in, in a sort of forward-looking and planning way, um, I think the best we can do with it is to say that we, you know, we have pretty good models for, especially on the temperature side, a little less so on, the, on the, the rainfall, the precipitation side, but on the temperature side, we have pretty good models at a pretty local level um, about what climate change is gonna look like in the next 50 years. And I think we just have to take that into account when we try and set up realistic goals of, Again, from my point of view, what species are going to make it and what species are going to be a really big challenge. So one of the fishes that everybody talks about is the southern steelhead. It's a you know, endangered or threatened species, um, <clears throat> used to be in the LA River, requires cold, clear water. Um, we may be able to make clear water. It's not quite so easy to make cold water, especially under climate change. And I think you just have to be realistic about that and say that if those species are gonna be facing challenges both from you know, the urban environment that the LA River runs through and then on top of that, from climate change, that until we can turn climate change around, 
you know, we may well not get those species, and we just have to be comfortable with that. And Mike, from the mayor's office point of view, what is, what is the definition of success in environmental restoration? And um, what, what does it look like? If, if you were to take an average weekend, if, if the mayor could get the river he wanted, what would happen at the river? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> As I, I'll allude to, I guess what I said a bit earlier is we have a lot of different ways to, to define success. So aside from the ecosystem um, work, once we have that you know, connected bikeway, once we have a trail system um, that has made it so that there aren't sections of the river that are fenced off that say closed to the public, that's going to be a huge marker of success in terms of what does the river corridor mean in the lives of Angelinos on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that's, that's a clearer goal, obviously. With the ecosystem restoration, uh, the Los Angeles Re uh, River Ecosystem Restoration Plan specifically, um, success, there, uh, we don't have to go into here, but there actually are specific objectives um, about um, restoring fr uh, freshwater marsh habitat, restoring key confluences where smaller you know, rivers and streams meet the Los Angeles River main stem. Um, those are the ways that will def define success for ourselves. Have we, in a meaningful way, found key locations to change the channel wall and reconnect the river with floodplain? Can we do that in one of the most important areas of the river, the Taylor Yard G2 parcel. That will be a marker of success. Um, have we, at the confluence of the Arroyo Seco, found, you know, done the design, found the funding, and changed, removed, restructured concrete there to create soft bottom uh, river and establish habitat? And that connect, you know, those confluence connections are key because they go up to the up, upstream, yep. through the upstream tributaries <clears throat> to the other habitat areas like the mountains. Um, that will be a marker of success. So those are, they're going to take a long time. Um, in the meantime, I think we are also looking at the uh, ecosystem and wildlife related um, uh, projects and programs that we're doing outside of the big federal project. Um, we are still opening um, bikeways and greenways, as I mentioned, that have native landscaping, native habitat in them. The city has established native, uh, native landscaping guidelines and standards for new development within the river corridor. And we are still at sort of a baseline phase in some of this. But I think in the few years, we'll be able to actually you know, see, identify some real change in the corridor, especially when it comes to native plants. In the past, during rainy seasons, whatever those used to be, um, <laughs> there were safety concerns with the LA River. And there's an LA River rescue unit in the fire department. And yet we look at the beach, we don't fence off 1,800 miles of beach. So a lot of that comes to turning around public attitudes too. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, we're a coastal place, um, the river has been a, a place that has been cut off from daily life for a long time. And I think we, you know, we see the evidence of that in the way that we understand and interact with waterways here in Southern California. I'm actually not from California myself. I'm from the Midwest. And there was more, I think, I, I, we had an, an innate sense of, of um, the you know, river's function and the danger around waterways. And I think we probably have a ways to go in terms of uh, establishing, establishing that same understanding here, but we're a coastal, you know, we're a coastal place. We're beachgoers, and that that seems to be yeah, a little more automatic. Yeah. And Christine, because these are, you know, I'm from the Midwest too, and th those were year-round rivers, and ours are seasonal rivers. And so, what kids may read in a textbook may bear no relation to what it is that they're seeing right out there in their backyard sometimes too. Right. I mean, I think that that sometimes the way the river looks doesn't, isn't what they imagine a river is supposed yeah. to look like. Um, and I do think the, you're right, that there needs to be education around the fact that it's, an, it's a river still and it's, it can be a dangerous place and people need to be very cautious about 
um, that in the same way that they are when they go to the beach. It's, that educational piece is really important also. Um, is there a model, Brad, of a place that has done a successful job that we would look to? Is it San Antonio? I mean, even if you look at Paris, I mean, the Seine is paved and everybody thinks that's a fab fabulous river. Yeah, what's my favorite comparison? Um, you know, I think the East River in New York City is, a, is an interesting one from a biological point of view um, because it has gone from being a place that had essentially no biodiversity value to a place that has had incrementally increasing uh, biodiversity value. Now it's, it's an Eastern River and, and, and it's also a funny little river that, that forms part of the boundary of Manhattan. So it's a, um, it's a little bit different, but um, I guess at least from a biodiversity point of view, that's, that's my best model. I'm, I'm not thinking of one of a Western seasonal river um, offhand that, that strikes me as a great model. Uh, and, and so, Christine, when we are talking about river access, do most of the kids who go to your school live nearby? They do. And so it's, they've been aware of it maybe, but not as knowledgeably as you're taking them to. I think that they, I mean, I think both, I mean, our school's a neighborhood school, so the purpose is for, the reason that the school was developed and built was because for many, many years, families who lived right in the Elysian Valley area and the Cypress Park area didn't have a school to, to go to. Um, so it does serve the community that it sits in, which I think is the beauty of our school. If people can walk to school, it's accessible. Um, I do think that there is an understanding and recognition that there's a river there, um, but I do think that at least for us, part of what we've really tried to do is work to enhance that understanding. So for example, we were part of a project um, recently where students were able to design the spaces that hit the river, the cul-de-sacs that sometimes go right up to the river. Um, those areas sometimes just become, you know, sometimes a place for graffiti and other things like that. And so we were able to be part of this design project that's gonna be implemented in the next six months or so around beautifying those areas that are right close to the river. So again, it's a really nice opportunity for students who live there to be part of something that connects them directly to the river um, and, and also shows their ability to make improvements in, in real and tangible ways. And, and Brad, when we talk about restoration, whether it's native mm -hmm. plus non-native, you know, on that scale of yep. zero to 100. What are the, the practicalities of this? I mean, will people, as this project proceeds, will people literally be carrying crates of salamanders from X point and saying, here you well, are, I, the Glendale Narrows, baby, live it well, out. I, I can only hope so, but, um, <clears throat> but you know, I think the, the, the practicalities are that for for some species, I mean, for some species, I think we can do, you know, what the current plan basically says, which is we restore the hydrology, we can restore, at least to a certain extent, the plants, we can dig up plants and plant new ones, that's not that hard, and then we see what happens. Um, and I think that works well for birds, I think it works well for butterflies, um, as I've said, I think it doesn't work very well for turtles or frogs or, or you know, the important animals out there. Um, what I think we will need to do in order to get those animals out there, and this is actually something I kind of wanted to ask Christine about, is um, we're going to have to have really active human intervention and management. Some of that is, yep, it's hauling those salamanders around and, and dumping them in, in the appropriate places. And in some cases, it's also doing programs where we captive breed those animals. We captive breed our only native turtle, southwestern pond turtle, or we captive breed um, fishes like, like the Royal Chub or something, um, and, and then put them in the river and then watch them and study them. And one of the things I've wondered about is, you know, I mean, having an organic garden is great, you know? Growing up a species that you're going to put back into the river, that could also be great. And that could We're be totally in. And that we could would be, totally yeah. be in. And that would you be hear that, such parents? A, yeah. <laughs> that would be such a great project for be. schools to do. It would and, be. And, you know, there's, there's 
But this is, this is where citizen science comes yeah, in, which is absolutely. something the museum is very dedicated absolutely. to. So at some point, maybe we'll be getting a flyer from the mayor's office saying, interested in breeding turtles in your backyard you for the bet. river? Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or on your campus. Yeah, yeah I, Which I think would be huge. Underlying, of course, the species, you have soil along those banks that has been full of chemicals for 150 years. You've got creosote and oil. And yeah. so is that where you start with the restoration is what is literally underfoot right now? Well, I mean, that's, that partly goes back to the mayor's office, too, sure. I mean, you know, you, there, there, are, there are certain cleanup procedures that have to happen. Um, some of that can be biologically mediated. Some of that has to be, you know, kind of human mediated. Um, I actually think the first place that we should be starting right now is to, to know both biologically and in terms of, of chemicals, exactly what's in that soil as we move along the whole the whole bed. You know, we can now do all this fancy, cool stuff where you you take a plug of soil and you grind it up and you see what the DNA of the bacteria and the fungi and all the other microorganisms that live in that soil are, and you ask from that point of view, how healthy is it? Many of those microorganisms are really, really good at at dealing with and also changing soil. And I think that's a really important thing that nobody ever, or we don't see a lot of in the press. We see a lot about birds and turtles. We don't, or at least birds, we don't see a lot about soil microbes. Um, and I think we should um, in order to find out how those, there may be ongoing biological processes that are cleaning up that soil right now and we don't even know about it. And that's an important And so, Mike, is your office then the one that's responsible for corralling all the science that exists and saying we need a little research here, we need a lot of research here, and then we can come up with a plan? Well, it's really a team effort. Um, in, in terms of the, our, the ecosystem restoration plan, that's, uh, we're the, the, the city is a close uh, sponsor and hand-in-hand and -hand partner with the federal government through the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But you know, credit is due to the U.S. Army Corps for developing that plan and being the technical leads uh, on, on the project. So um, they've done a great job in terms of corralling the science and working with their own staff scientists and biologists and developing the plan. Um, and yeah, and, and in, other situ in other circumstances, we certainly would play the role if we want to look at a you know a new wildlife park or some other uh, some other effort that has to do with habitat. We would definitely reach out to our you know our our friends in in the the scientific and academic community. One thing I've seen recently is I'm just very encouraged by is. Um, an ever-growing engagement with the river from uh, our, the academic community in Southern California, which has been fantastic. Um, obviously, UCLA is involved in today's discussion. UCLA is also um, looking at best practices for the Greenway and published a recent guide out of the, the planning school. Um, so you know, we're seeing it more and more and more. We've had USC involved as well. And I think as we get now into the design phase of our ecosystem project, it's, you know, we will find ourselves in a situation where we will need to go back out again to, to the technical experts um, to make sure that we're all still on the same page. And, uh, you know, so the relationships are definitely, are definitely uh, building. Because literally the underpinning, the science that underpins this is important to the ultimate success. The last thing you want to happen is to, you know, throw some topsoil down, you know, put in some plants, uh, let loose some turtles and cut a ribbon and say, here it is. And five years later, if it looks awful, people are going to say, well, see, restoration doesn't work. Yeah. That's, that's true, um, which is why, you know, the, the plan that we're pursuing with federal government is, it's, it's, it's definitely a deep thinking, science-based, science-driven plan. And so, Brad, we're talking about the kind of science that's available. People have been looking at parts of the river and different aspects of it for a long time, including yep. you and a lot of your colleagues. Is there a clearinghouse? Is there something that will be working with the mayor, something that you would even suggest that could say, here's the central source for the science we have, here's the list of what we need. I mean, it's like a Christmas list, right? You know, right. take it to Santa and say, I need soil samples here, here, here. Right. See the, ho, ho, ho. That's right. See, the, the beauty of Christmas lists, though, is that there's only one Santa, and there's a <laughs> lot of scientists, and they don't always agree on exactly what that Christmas list should look like, um, which is just 
you know, it's, it's the beauty of the fact that, that many of us, uh, you know, work in different areas and have, have different priorities. Um, to the best of my knowledge, Pat, there is not a single clearinghouse. And um, there are clearly, there certainly should be, and that's something that should, I think, work ideally through the mayor's office simply because, you know, that's the, both from a funding point of view and also, um, you know, just, just from a kind of regulatory point of view, that's the, that's the place where, where it should all be. Um, and I think there are lots of small and medium-sized studies that have been done, you know, including, you know, what high school kids have been doing along the river that, that um, are done as internal projects but aren't all put together in a place where they can be accessed and they can, you know, we can make sure we're not duplicating efforts that, you know, that, that we're getting the best bang for our buck in terms of, of, uh, of identifying and doing um, the work that needs to be done in, in the future. And I think, I think it's an absolutely important idea. You know, now that's not free either. I mean, it costs money to, to curate and develop large databases. It, it you know, it takes time and, and effort uh, to make those a reality and to make them useful. I think it would be an incredibly important and useful project. I don't know. I would agree. It'd be, it would be wonderful to have that resource. Uh, to, uh, to my knowledge, yeah, there isn't sort of a one clearinghouse, um, but there's, of course, uh, lots, of, lots of work on the subject. And I think yeah. it's key that it is place-based and local and, mm -hmm. you know, tied to the Mediterranean type climate that we have here in Southern California. We're only one of five Mediterranean type climates in the world, um, which if I remember correctly, cover about 2% of the Earth's surface, but something account for like something like 20% yeah. of all the plant species in the world. Um, so we definitely need to, we need to develop the, the expertise here because it's not, it, it's not necessarily transferable from from anywhere else that has a river system. We're, you know, we're, we and other partners on the globe really should be working together in that. And I think we mm -hmm. can look to the academic uh, institutions in, in our area to make international connections in developing this expertise as well. And w when I think of biodiversity, there's a story you probably know by Aldo Leopold about an airplane flying and it pops a rivet and it can keep flying and it pops another, but it, at some point if you pop enough rivets, that airplane can't fly any longer. And so the complexities of biodiversity I think are interesting because yes, we love this butterfly species, but you have to plant this kind of plant right. in order to sustain yeah. it, which needs this kind of water in order to right. grow. I mean, the complexities are mind boggling. They, they are. Um they certainly are, and that's, you know, that's been what I've studied for most of my career. Um, but there is another side to that, which is, I mean, you know, you take, take butterflies and plants, right? So we, we all know, you know, monarch butterflies, and, you know, they're very, very, very fussy about the kinds of plants that they lay their eggs on. You know, they only, their, lar their caterpillars, you know, only like milkweeds. But it turns out that, you know, they're pretty happy with non-native milkweeds, too. And who'd have thought that? You know, we all thought they were so specialized and so fussy in particular. Um, and they're pretty fussy, but they're not quite as fussy as we thought. And they're, those, those kinds of, of um, opportunities that, that mean that we can sort of work a little bit more with what we have. You know, how many cliff-dwelling species view a concrete wall as something kind of like a cliff? Hawks and, in New York. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, peregrine falcons like, falcons, like you know, uh, vertical buildings. Um, you know, could we get kingfishers back on the vertical um, soil walls because they nest in cavities that they make in those walls? Um, a, a lot of things like that are opportunities, and I, and I think one of the points of that is that we have a lot of great basic ecology that can help us understand some of those complexities, and to a certain extent, as this whole process of trying to rebuild the river unfolds, you also have to view it a little bit as an experiment and just say there are things, this is a completely man-made environment even as we try to restore it. It still is, it's not what the LA River was, it's not what it was supposed to be, it's not ever gonna be like that again. Um, and in that sense, we have this sort of huge experiment 
in trying to bring back biodiversity. And it'll be very interesting to see how the animals and plants respond to that. Just as it's interesting now, you know, you, you walk out on the LA River and you see cormorants that like to sit on a rock and dry out their feathers. Well, you know, they're sitting on chunks of concrete and drying out their feathers. And for them, that concrete's fine. We wouldn't have known that necessarily. And so I think treating it as a little bit of an experiment where we see what happens and we see what animals and plants can do with our efforts is something very important. And grading on a curve, therefore, because it took tens of thousands of years for that river to get what it, to being a river. Yeah. And we're looking at maybe 50 years of investing in this. Uh-huh. So, so, so we have to grade on a curve. Oh, yeah, no, saying, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. That, that's right. And, um, I mean, again, I think, I, to my mind, you know, the notion of, of progress and success is incremental. It involves something, again, we like to say in the environmental world of uh, adaptive management, which means you try something. If it doesn't work, you say, okay, well, I learned something from that. It's kind of like treating it as an experiment. And you say, That's okay, well, I'll method. try something else. Yeah, I'll, I'll try something else. I'll tweak it. I'll dump that idea, but I'll try a new idea. And in that way, in terms of adaptive management, you move forward and you slowly accumulate progress over time. And I think that's what we should be shooting for. Christine, you are creating a generation of kids who are much more aware than earlier generations and much more conscientious. There are people in the audience here who are interested in STEM as well. Are you seeing this influence some career choices in your kids? Absolutely. I mean, our goal is to, First and foremost, our goal is to make sure that we're, that we're uh, educating our kids around critical thinking, asking important questions, and really learning the science hands-on. So our belief is that the more that students actually engage in real life science, the more that that interest will be peaked at a young age and they'll be more interested in doing that as a, as a career choice. And we are seeing that. We're a young school. This is our sixth year, so we've only had a few graduating classes, but many of our students have gone on to pursue engineering, both computer and environmental. Um, and they'll attribute the, I think that the breaking down the barriers around science, um, I think at the high school level works when there can be this real hands-on experimental approach, um, which kind of, you know, science is sometimes a scary subject and it's sort of, you know, Unbraids no, that. Not yes. with Brown. No, it can't at all. Come on. Scary at all. <laughs> so, so yes, we are definitely seeing seeing that come to fruition at the collegiate level for our students as well. And and so, Mike, when we look at biodiversity in Los Angeles, this place is so big. You've got sort of the beach, you know, um, uh, microclimate, microsystem. You've got interior pocket parks, you know, in places that are really paved to a fairly well. So where does the river fit, the idea of bringing back the river in, in the larger um, presence of a green Los Angeles? I mean, I think the river is really the, it's the backbone of the system, in, in my view. And now, I'm, obviously, I'm not a biologist. I'm not, a, not a, um, a scientist in that sense myself. But from everything I've learned working on the river and developing the projects and reports that, that we've worked on, that variety um, of our ecosystem is, cr that's what makes you know, us who we are and it makes, that's what makes our environment what it is. The fact that we have such changes in scale from the bed of the river up to the mountains that are next to it so quickly and that some of the year it's so dry and other times of the year it's raining hard and there's a torrent in the river, that, dr that drama in the habitat is what makes us who we are and it's what gives us our biodiversity. I think, if I, hopefully I'm <laughs> not too far afield here, that, that those, you know, those dynamics really have caused a lot of the variation that we see. And, uh, you know, so it's, um, ref, you know, respecting that is sort of respecting ourselves, I think. Is, is is the momentum really, has it picked up enough steam because it took so long, it was Sisyphean pushing this rock uphill to get <laughs> enough people interested in it, to get the federal government to think differently about the river as an ecosystem and not just a flood channel. So do you think there's momentum? Is, is the rock rolling in the right direction? I know, I know that there is momentum. I, 
I, it's, that is clear as day. Now, the complexities of the work that, that we've all discussed do contribute to um, you know, a, what can seem like a very slow pace in developing and studying and planning and designing, but the momentum is roaring. Um, I'm happy to be able to say that just, just last week, uh, U, U.S. Congress yeah. passed the Water Resources uh, Development Act 2016, yeah. which is, it's called the WERDA Bill. And um, I think we're still waiting, I think, for you know, a couple of the last uh, hurdles to get over. But that bill is what is authorizing the project that we, the city council, uh, you know, we, the city represented by the city council, adopted in June that we've been working on for 10 years with the Army Corps of Engineers. So now we've adopted it. The federal government has adopted it. The momentum is there. We're moving forward. I'd like each of you to speak to, because we've already addressed citizen science to some degree, but the LA River does not run exclusively through the city of Los Angeles, although the bulk of it does. Can you speak to going outside of city agencies, outside of LAUSD, looking at Northeast trees, tree people, some of the other environmental, um, environmentally engaged groups around here, mm -hmm. and see what they've been doing, what their interest is, and what you see as a role for groups like that that may think, yeah, I'm 30 miles from the river, I don't have anything to do with it, but maybe make the case that in fact it does. Okay, well, <clears throat> I think, um, I mean, so I know my Lacrette Center at UCLA, um, we've been pushing fairly hard lately on, on citizen science programs um, in the greater LA area, uh, specifically because, well, really for two reasons. One, one is that, um, if you want to get, it's one thing to get buy-in from the mayor's office, it's one thing to get another to get buy-in from, you know, a very targeted local school. You really want buy-in from all of you guys, right? You want buy-in from everybody. Get your lab coats, That's in other right. words. <laughs> you want buy-in from, and, and, and the question is, how can people contribute in a meaningful way to understanding, in my world, the biodiversity of our city and, and how that sort of relates to projects like the LA River. And the way you can do that is by mobilizing the fact that, you know, if we have four million people in this city, you know, we have eight million eyes. And people, one of the things we do not know, and this is absolutely true, we do not know this in the city of Los Angeles, we don't know this in the county, is what plants and animals we have where. And we need a census. We need a census. And the Natural History Museum has been very um, strong on that with um, projects using, you know, these wonderful kind of social media tools like iNaturalist where, you know, you see a lizard. So there's this great project I happen to love that Greg Pauly, the curator of reptiles and amphibians here, is a part of. And we've been working very closely with them at UCLA. It's called Rascals, the Reptiles and Amphibians of Southern California. Oh, you get all the good acronyms. We do. Well, Greg thought that one up, and it was a real winner. And, um, and so what that is, is you see a lizard in your yard, and you know, it doesn't matter where you live, anywhere in, in the greater LA basin. You see a lizard in your yard, you take a picture of it, you send it into Rascals. Greg or one of his team looks at it, identifies it, lets you know what it is, builds up a database of where do our native species live? Where do our non-native species live? What are the nurseries that they're coming in from? Because that's where all the non-native lizards and frogs and stuff come in is through nurseries that are bringing them in from Florida or Hawaii or other places. Um, what can we do to stem the flow of those non-natives? What can we do to enhance the quality of life for the natives? And that's citizen science driven. And we can never get that information and we can never get so we can never get that information if we don't have people with their eyes out looking. And one of the great consequences of that, too, is that then you get people, more people, who care about the birds in their yard, who care about, you know, whether or not they've got a toad living in their garden. And, and that's huge, because that's where you get the buy-in and the connections, people willing to invest a little bit of money and effort in increasing the biodiversity of our city. And Christine? I would say some of those organizations you referenced, I mean, working with nonprofit groups uh, for us at the, at the high school level has been really beneficial because I think it serves two purposes. One, it 
gets kids out doing the work that is important to kind of connect to what mm -hmm. Brad's talking about, becoming citizens of the environment and understanding better what, what, um, what kinds of things they can do. And secondly, it also introduces them to people who are really passionate about this work and it creates for them an, another example of somebody who's made a career out of, out of really caring about, about the environment and what's happening. So for us, we, we partner with as many organizations as we can because it, again, provides good exposure for the students on that level. And Mike, your office can actually put some muscle into this. <laughs> You're right. We work. I mean, there are so many organizations and individuals and agencies to work with. Obviously, you know, you know, being the city, we have a, a a strong role in agency coordination and collaboration. We work very closely with Los Angeles County. The uh, Los Angeles County has its own river master plan that um, is very consistent with what with the city's goals. Um, there's a lot of activity now happening actually along the river south of the city of LA where there are another 17 cities through which the, the river runs. It's a very different situation in which the upper 32 miles are primarily through LA, of course, and they're also bordered by uh, Burbank and Glendale for some stretches. So there's a, certainly a lot of communication um, that's, that needs to be and is always ongoing amongst other cities and agencies. Um, and then, of course, the river family, the community of community-based organizations and nonprofits and, and, and in, uh, neighborhood councils um, are you know, sometimes, you know, it can, it can be like sitting around a Thanksgiving, big Thanksgiving table with your family and we don't always agree on every aspect and we might have some squabbles or some history, but, but we're all still family and we're all still pulling in the same direction and generally all on the same page and I think what the ultimate goals we want for the river. And it's up to us to just make sure we keep talking and communicating and working together. We're going to hear from a couple of people who are going to be around when some of this is actually going to happen, to come to fruition with the river. They're both students at Christine School. They're both seniors there. Monica Hernandez and Abraham Hernandez have won a contest about writing a short essay about the river, and we're going to hear from each of them in turn, and then we'll take questions from you. Monica, can you come up to the microphone and go first? Can we give her a hand? Not that kind of hand, but that's good, too. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. There we go. You guys are so smart. Hi, my name is Monica Hernandez. I go to Los Angeles River School as a senior. Um, well, we got this essay like Thursday and I wrote it in a day, so I hope you guys like it. <laughs> the Lost Paradise. I intend to live my life surrounded by trees, rivers, animals, with sunshine keeping me warm and covered in freckles. I will not accept being encompassed by white floors and, and walls which limit my imagination and happiness. The Los Angeles River is the home I'm able to enjoy with my family and friends and neighbors. As the years go by, fewer and fewer people visit the Los Angeles River and for this reason, I'd like to share my ideas on how to make the river more inviting. The improvement that would the improvement that would revitalize the LA River is to remove most of the concrete so the water has a natural flow and native plants can grow. I believe if the river has more wildlife, more people would visit. I suggest making it a community friendly by building nearby parks and benches so visitors can picnic on the grass and, or sit and admire the natural beauty. More trees, more trash cans, Maybe even splash pads for the hot summers and autumn days. Use recycled water would attract way more users. Earlier this year, we had a tra tragic incident where two of our peers drowned at the Ellie River. In their memory, I would like to see a fence or some type of border built so it's safe. There should also be signs warning visitors not to swim or wade in the water because there are spots where the water is deep and the currents are too fast. Another improvement is to build a bridge over the river so one can safely, so one can walk safely from one side to the other. The 21st century consists of technology and we tend to isolate ourselves from nature. 
The revitalization of the river is needed to find the beauty and peace that surrounds all of us. Thank you. Now you can give her a real hand. And Abraham Hernandez. Hello, Hello everyone. Um, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask for a second round of applause for such an amazing <laughs> essay. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe I can top that off, but uh, I'll give my best shot. Uh, so here it goes. Um, have you ever thought what use the river has? Uh, we have used it for biking, running, and various other recreational activities. It also serves as a home for various wildlife and feeds many animals. To me, the, rivers, the river symbolizes tranquility and peace. I believe it is a beautiful place we must protect, otherwise it may not be around for future generations to enjoy. The river is a big part of our community. It is a small piece of what was before the building of our beautiful city. It is a place of peace with a rare mixture of urban and nature. It is important to incorporate the river into our city because it is a place where we can escape everyday life. I believe it is not just protecting our beloved, I believe in not just protecting our beloved river, but also restoring and making it more than what it is today. I believe, I would like to one day see the river as a river and not just another sewage disposal source. I want it to look more natural with rocks and maybe a waterfall and introduce more native plants and animals. I believe if the river was if the river was more beautiful, it would not only attract many locals, but would also encourage many tourists and others to come and enjoy LA's beautiful river. I truly believe we can make the river a beautiful place again. Thank you. Abraham. Let's get you back up to the microphone if I can ask you a question there. So having heard what we were saying up here today, how, how optimistic do you feel about the river becoming what it is you described in your essay? Well, I believe it can be done. Um, I don't know if we can do it. I, I hope we can do it soon. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful vision. And I would definitely love, um, I would love my kids and my kids' kids to eventually be able to enjoy it. And um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks. And Monica? <clears throat> and what did you think about what you heard here today? Um, well, I would really like to see something more than concrete and more animals because I love animals and reptiles and bugs. All right. <laughs> you made an impression. And I didn't make her yes. say that. And so. plants. <laughs> it might not be the most perfect river ever, but it would, I hope it ends up being more of a river and more plants. I don't think it would happen really soon, as Abraham said, maybe like you mentioned in 50 years, but I hope to still be alive to see it. <laughs> so do we all, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now let's take your questions. We have a couple of people who are going to be handling the mics and coming to you. We're going to keep control of the mic because, you know, in four years you can run for president, but right now it's all taken. <laughs> so, we'll hold on to the mics for you. Raise your hands and we'll come to you. And please try to address your question to somebody on the panel. Okay, right here first. Uh, Brad, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, like, the history of the LA River, you know, in regards to, like, the channelization and what it looked like before to give a kind of a context to when we we're trying to, you know, restore it to a more natural native. And then a second question, a little bit, could you talk about some of the native and non-native plants that we do find in the LA River and the Sepulveda Basin and, you know, yeah. things like that? Um, I can speak somewhat to that. So, you know, the, the LA River historically was, you know, kind of a, kind of a classic Western arid land river. It means it, did not have a full flow. I mean, this came up earlier in, in our discussion, you know, using an eastern river that, that is a flowing river year round um, is, is a very poor model for it. It's a river that 
would dry up or nearly dry up some of the time. It's a river uh, sort of had a braided channel, as they say, which means that once it came out of the mountains and sort of found its way across the flat part of the LA basin, um, it would wander, it would change, you get a big flash flood, it shifts its channel, jumps over, jumps back. It was that kind of a very, very dynamic river and that, that dynamism was a big part of its health. Um, you get lots of nutrients that come down during those flash floods, they get redistributed, that makes the plants happy and stuff. Uh, and that's just a, a part of the game. And you see that in, you know, you, you see that in other, you know, arid lands, rivers around the world um, that, that aren't as contained as the LA River is. And I think one of the things that if you read the Army Corps of Engineers report, if you read any of the reports, you know, we're going to try to get that, reconstruct that on a very modest scale in some very small areas. And that's just because the reality is that river can't jump all over the place anymore. We just can't have that. But we have a few, you know, 20, 30, 40 acre patches where it will be able to move around a little bit. It will be able to have a braided channel. And I think, I think that's biologically important. And I, and, I, and I think it's also just almost kind of spiritually important, I think, to let it do that at least a little bit. I just think that's an incredibly cool vision that the city and the Army Corps has put together. Um, you asked about plants, and um, sadly, I'm not much of a botanist. Plants. So let's let's get okay. a, a quick answer on okay, that. You, yeah, you did address a lot of the, the Yeah, I, I did, but the, um, the, I mean, I think in terms of, of plants and animals, I think we have a good working base to work with already, especially for, for some species. We have a pretty good sense of what should be there, and I think we have some very strong restoration plans in place to bring those back. It's important to remember, I wrote a book about the LA River some years ago, it's important to remember how much it affected the rest of the ecosystem. For example, the river used to flow down to about here and then turn west instead of going down south, and it replenished the beaches because all the stones and the gravel that it brought down from the mountains got pummeled into sand, and that re replenished the beaches because then sand, once you, once you paved the river, you started losing that sand and you had to bring in sand from elsewhere to keep the beaches replenished. You had, you know, in the 1850s, when kind of we switched to sort of a Yankee um, government ownership model in this country or in this state, you had a sense that, well, the river isn't any good because it can't move objects around, it can't move barges and trade, and so the river was viewed as not important. And it was, an it was viewed, frankly, as a nuisance because you had floods, 1914, 1934, 1936, that took real estate off the market because it flooded, and they said, we can't take real estate off the market, and so you end up channelizing something, and the impact of that was much, much greater than anybody ever conceived. So I hope that helps a little bit. And we have another question. We'll hold on to the mic, thank you. At the beginning of the talk, Pat Morrison mentioned the Olmstead brothers' vision that evaporated. And kind of in the middle, we talked to Mike about, is there an overarching organization clearinghouse? And I'm wondering, what's Frank Gehry doing? Oh. All right, we're all still waiting for the big uh, reveal on Frank Gehry. Well, I'm waiting too. <laughs> <laughs> nice question. So, Mr. Gehry um, is, was uh, contracted by an organization called River LA. River LA was formerly known as the LA River Revitalization Corporation, which was uh, one of the entities recommended by the city's master plan and was originally founded by the city. And we've, we in the city, uh, the city and River LA have worked closely together for years and they're you know, a strong member of the, the river community, the river landscape. Um, so, you know, speaking on behalf of the city, we're super excited to have a talent like Mr. Geary involved. I can't wait to see, you know, what he and his large team comes up with. And I would note that they actually have put together uh, quite an extensive uh, a team of experts on hydrology and hydraulics and and um, you know public policy. It, it goes a bit beyond there. Um, so I'm excited to see to see what what they come up with. But I, I think yeah, there, it's not quite uh, I guess ready What's, for. Is there a time. deadline? I don't I don't believe so. I don't believe there's a deadline. Um, I think as I understand it right now, it's there. Um, what they've done so far is collected a, a lot of information and done their own sort of 
um, research project centered on the river, and, and you can find the results of their work on um, a website called the LA River Index, which I forget if that's the actual address, but you should be able to find it pretty easily in a search engine. And f so from that sort of data-driven process are now, I believe, as I understand it, are in uh, looking at some specific sites, but really um, still letting the data kind of drive the, you know, the next phase of the work. So I, w I wish I could tell you, could tell you more, but um, I, I think, you know, we'll probably find out a lot of that together. We're all waiting. <laughs> Next question. Yes, I really like the idea of not holding the mic. So that's a very smart idea. Um, for 20 years, there's a key parcel along the river that's near the Rio de Los Angeles and near the school called the G2 parcel. And that parcel is still what's the leftover from the Union Pacific. I think they're still owned by Un Union mm -hmm. Pacific. Yep. And the city's supposed to buy it. but. It's been polluted. It's been polluted for all that time. The state never made them clean it up, and now the city's going to pay for cleaning it up? Is well, we spoke to the, the soil quality issue yeah. is a, a fundamental one, yeah. so I don't know about the, the yeah. financial. I mean, do you want to yeah, speak I, to the? Uh, you know, I, yeah, that's, that's true. That, that parcel is, uh, it is still owned by Union Pacific, and it is still for sale, and the city has been uh, in negotiation to purchase the, the parcel uh, for a number of years. Um, and um, and the subject of remediation, I think you know it's important to to face that head on and realize that in the river corridor, like other parts of the city, there there's been decades of industrial uses and use by rail industry. So you know we should come to terms with just the reality that mo many of the sites that we will need to address as we build parks or restore the river will have contamination and we'll have to clean it up. And rather than, you know, um, be, be uh, you know, frightened by that, we should be obviously cautious and deliberate, but um, that's an opportunity to improve the city's environment that we, I think, you know, we should face head on and we will as appropriate. Because pollutants don't stop at a property line, too, and right. that's one thing that yeah. everybody has to take into account here. There's another question, Marisol? Yeah, we have, t we have time for two more questions. Okay. Okay, awesome. Um, last year, I took a English class based on LA and specifically the LA River, and I did some reading and said most of the water from the LA River comes from recycling water plants. So I was wondering if part of the revitalization um, project includes shifting the, uh, well, uh, shifting or like uh, incorporating more of natural water, maybe groundwater, into the LA River rather than it being such a high percentage of recycled water. Right, instead of just the releases from the Tillman plant. Yeah. So it might. Yeah, it's it's true. Yeah, that's um, uh, much of the uh, most of, uh, of the dry weather flow. So when it's not raining, is uh, treated effluent from water reclamation plants. Um, so. That's another way that we've actually altered the, the flow regime of the river is not just through channelization, but also in terms of the water that we allow to reach the river and the water that we directly discharge into the river. Uh, so yes, the, the, even the small, what might seem to be a small amount of water that flows to the river on a, you know, on a day that's not raining in the middle of summer is still probably a lot more than historically sure. would be and that might actually it might have, you know, that it contributes to the changes we've made yeah. biologically. Yeah, no, it, it, so it contributes hugely. And I think, I think in answer to your question briefly, there's sort of two parts to it. One is the volume of water and one is the quality of that water. Um, I, I thought you were more thinking about the quality of the water. Um, and, you know, by and large, there's nothing wrong with water. If, you know, if it's a tertiary treatment plant, there's nothing wrong with the water coming out of those plants. That's fine in, in terms of its, you know, ability to, to support a healthy ecosystem. Now, in terms of the volume of water and whether we want to have a temporary river that only flows during our Mediterranean climate winter rainy season or whether we want to have a river that flows year-round, interestingly enough, we have that as a couple of options, and we, we can decide on that, and, and that's something that, that does require some decisions. I think it's going to be more or less a permanently flowing river, and that's going to make it different than it was, but that's okay. You know, it, it, it still affords a lot of opportunities for, for a lot of great wildlife and, and native biodiversity. And our last question. Um, we'll hold the mic. Oh, Thank you. Okay, this is for Brad. 
Uh, I saw, the, last year, I saw this amazing lizard on my patio uh, that I've never seen before. I live in, near Valley College, near where the runoff goes. Oh. And he was huge and beautiful. And uh, my cat, cats usually love lizards and go after their tails, but my cat was like, no, I don't think I'll bother with this one. <laughs> Smart. And I took a picture of it, and where can I send that picture? Because you said to uh, well, send... Well, you, you can just hang around for one minute after this talk, and you and I can, can take a look at it. Um, <laughs> and if that doesn't... Okay, and if you don't have it with you, which is very sad, um, you can send it to me, and I can give you my email address. Uh, you can send it to Rascals, to the program that the Natural History Museum um, hosts, and they can tell you what it is. Uh, either one of those. I'd be happy okay. to talk with you afterwards. Uh, boy, now we all want to see that. So, got a you couple bet. of people I'd like you to thank. Photographer Grove Pashley, whose work you're seeing back there. Yeah. He helped us start the kayaking tours of the LA River so you can tell all your snotty New York friends, yes, we have kayaking tours on the LA River. From the museum, uh, we have Marisol Hara and Vanessa Kerwin and Mario um, Colon from UCLA, so thanks yeah. to you. And please thank the LaCrette Center, the museum, and our panelists. Thank you very much for being here and for hanging around to look at that lizard picture. I think yeah, <laughs> thanks. All right. That was